Stanford University. Okay, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Venkat Banan-Narayanan. I uh, lead the integrated grid team at uh, NRECA, what uh, JP mentioned before. For those who don't know NRECA, we are the National Rural Electric Cooperatives Association. Uh, we are a trade association that represents uh, 900 plus electric cooperatives across the country. Uh, you heard JP talked about one of the efforts that we are engaged in, and also you uh, heard earlier in the morning Chad talk about uh, in, from Kotzebue, he's also from a cooperative, a director of a cooperative. So we're happy to be involved in multiple ways in the Ernest project. Um, so after this is the break, so we have that. But the good news is uh, I, I noticed that the first technical session had four projects. The previous one had three, and this one has two. So we're on the right progression down, right? So, <laughs> so that's, that's good. Um, so uh, we're going to hear uh, about challenges and solutions for cities. You heard about remote and isolated grids in the first one. Uh, the next one you heard about interconnected systems. Uh, and now you're going to hear about two projects uh, that, that focus on cities uh, to achieve the goals of Ernest. Uh, the first one, uh, I, let me introduce the panelists first. Uh, uh, we have Dr. Ilu Liu, uh, who's the professor and governor's chair for power electronics at University of Tennessee at uh, Knoxville. And uh, we have Dr. Parth Vaishnav, who is the Assistant Professor of Sustainable Systems uh, and at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. Uh, that's the one near Detroit, so sorry, Parth, about the Lions, if you're a fan. But we are in San Francisco, what else I can say? But uh, um, anyway, so, so the first project would be, uh, Dr. Liu would be talking about it, and, and uh, it has to do with landfills, uh, how to create uh, resilient microgrids in landfills. And uh, as you all know, landfills are across the country, so there is really a potential for wide application of that, uh, of that project uh, uh, through this program. Um, the other one, uh, Path is going to talk about uh, resilient strategies for uh, low-income communities, uh, using a community in the city of Ann Arbor as an example. And one of the things I like about this project is that it goes bottom up, you know, looking at the needs of that community first, the resilience needs, and then creating solutions to solve uh, those needs. So again, potential for wide application across the country. Uh, so we, we're going we're gonna, to uh, talk about these two projects, and then, of course, uh, any questions that you all have. So Ilu, would you like to go first? Thank you. All right. Looks like I skipped the first page, which is fine. Uh, I work at University of Tennessee. I also uh, work at Oak Ridge National Lab. Today I'm representing you know, uh, the University of Tennessee team for this, uh, uh, about our work. So I think it's a good start to look at this map. And this is where the landfills are in Tennessee. And uh, most of them uh, are actually closed. You know, the 94 are actually uh, currently closed landfill. And uh, as we you know, the population, uh, as we civilization moves on, we continue to increase those dots. And if you look at the nation, and we're talking about thousands of landfills, and uh, what we would like to do is those landfills are usually close to this advantaged community. Usually they're tucked in somewhere, a poor community. We find that being true, uh, that there's always some very dense uh, you know, living uh, quarters near the landfill. We feel that there may be a great opportunity. The first, this, this land uh, is very difficult to build on and to do other things. And they are also uh, approximate to uh, the city, you know, not that far from the city, and they're in a great location to tie in to the grid if we can make use of them. And what we like to achieve is to come up with some standard way to do this. You know, what are the uh, steps if you want to consider this process and be able to uh, make use of the land, also serve our disadvantaged uh, communities. So we start with Tennessee. We picked EPB, and many of you heard this is a quite progressive uh, municipal in uh, uh, Chattanooga. We also uh, picked the KUB, which is actually a very, uh, also getting into a very uh, advanced uh, municipal city. The way you can tell is because they start to own 
power, uh, fiber, and they serve the community, fiber, internet, as well as uh, uh, the media, and that comes with a tremendous uh, advantage in terms of revenue and the try adventures. So one thing we like to think about is uh, there's some special things about those microgrids. They're usually not huge size, and they're not uh, extremely strong ties. So, and another thing is uh, we wanted to, you know, there, there's not a huge amount of resources in terms of adding battery storage. So one option is by adding a, a few switches, maybe very, sometimes just one, that you can make this microgrid uh, adaptive or dynamic. And this is coming back from our Opera E project. We, will, we were able to make the uh, EPB microgrid near the airport dynamic. And that gave us the advantage of serving the largest possible boundary when the sun is very shiny, and when we experience cloud and other things, we can actually shrink it so that we can focus on certain community, certain critical load. So that's the key point, and we like to see if we can make tools and the guidelines so that other part of the country, not just southeast, which would we start with, but other part of the country or Mexico or Canada can benefit our uh, tools and uh, our procedures. So that's, okay, so what we, I'm showing here is the, in the circled area is one boundary, and the next one you can actually have it a, sub, a, a different boundary system. So it's quite straightforward, but it does take some effort to optimize and to be able to make it uh, economically. Yeah. The other uh, aspect uh, that the Tennessee team will study is the weather impact. So we had done earlier work with the NTR work that uh, Kevin Ling was leading is to look at the weather impact. And we look at here is the drought. You know, we notice that the temperature go up and the, the hydro facilities start to reduce power. Uh, even if it's not hydro, other generation, we can see that it's affected by the temperature uh, as well. And we also notice that load does not just linearly. It could go uh, much faster. When the temperature go up, you have a, a very large pickup of the load, which is actually quite uh, a challenge. And also, you know, your, your generation, uh, your basically, your generation also degrade, and your transmission also degrade because of the, the high temperature and the drought. So that's one of the challenges we can tie eventually to the microgrid and go into micro levels rather than what we did at the you know, broad transmission level. And uh, okay, so one other, the last item I wanted to mention is uh, we, in the, we're in the TVA service territory. And a few days ago, TVA just experienced the record high of load. And that's because we are getting into very single digits and negative uh, 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 weather. And what we, this means, you know, we are changing from a summer peak in our general area, now become a winter peak. So another critical area we are needing to, we do need to look into, you know, how do we make sure this com community who experience cold, like in the case of Texas, especially disadvantaged uh, communities, how do we make sure they are, uh, they are being kept warm and not neglected? So that's overall uh, structure of our work, and there are more uh, tasks to be added and more details. We look forward to continue uh, the, on this adventure. Thanks for your time. Yeah. All right. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so this project is about enhancing the resilience of uh, a low-income neighborhood in Ann Arbor. Um, as that neighborhood transitions uh, to using electricity, where it currently uses natural gas, uh, but also in the context of a changing climate and uh, the effect of the changing climate on the loads within that neighborhood, um, 
and also the context of a changing electricity system, which changes uh, because the climate is changing, because it's trying to uh, incorporate a larger proportion of uh, variable and uncertain energy resources. Uh, so the idea is, given all these changes, how do you ensure that uh, the neighborhood stays resilient and does so in a way that's equitable? Um, my collaborators on this project are Michael Craig, who's an uh, expert in uh, grid modeling in the context of a changing climate, uh, Arun Agrawal, who's, uh, who's a distinguished political scientist, uh, and who's interested in understanding how technology uh, deployment changes, uh, uh, changes equity. Uh, Malika Kotari, who's uh, a doctoral student who's working on this, and our partner on all of this is the Office of Sustainability and Innovation in the city of Ann Arbor, um, who are actually spearheading the effort to decarbonize the Bryant neighborhood. So I'll start with a bit of context. Um, the, uh, that's, a, that's a sort of map of the Bryant neighborhood. It's around 250 homes, mostly low income. Um, the labels on those charts have been left off, but uh, if you look at the horizontal bar diagram, uh, the first label corresponds to the income of uh, black residents in the, uh, in the Bryant neighborhood. The second one is white residents. The third is Hispanic residents. Uh, and the fourth one is Asian residents. And as you can see, across communities, uh, the median household income is much lower than Washtenaw County as a, as a whole. And that, that sort of uh, disadvantage is reflected in the employment statistics also. Uh, so the goals of the project really closely match the goals of Ernest as a whole. So the first thing is we want to go to these communities and actually understand uh, how they approach resilience right now. Uh, we sort of have the dubious good fortune of being in a part of a country uh, of the country where uh, long duration outages are not exactly a rare occurrence. Uh, it, it's dubious for obvious reasons, but it's good fortune because we can actually ask people how they uh, uh, deal with these events without them having to use their imagination. They remember the last time they had to cope with it. Uh, and then the idea is to co-develop with them tools that allow them to uh, design a system that can, uh, that can provide resilience as they electrify. Um, and as the climate changes and as, as the reliability of the electricity system changes. Um, and, and we want to work uh, with the community to test whether they can actually use these tools, whether it generates meaningful insights, um, and, and then to uh, help them deploy this tool. And this, this is a, not entirely an academic exercise. Uh, the city of Ann Arbor is trying to stand up uh, uh, what they call a sustainable energy utility, uh, which is effectively a large microgrid which is meant to operate in parallel with the existing investor-owned utility. Uh, some, of the, uh, some of these homes will eventually have two meters. Uh, the plan is to have these two utilities. And one of, uh, one of the reasons Ann Arbor is doing this is to decarbonize uh, faster than the investor-owned utility is able to, but the other reason is explicitly to provide resilience to these communities. Um, and finally, the idea is to try and develop metrics to characterize uh, how all of these efforts play out for different households, whether uh, there are differences in the preferences that people indicate and what it'll cost to provide resilience to different households, based on their social demographic characteristics. So uh, that last point really relates to metric development. Uh, this is a sort of schematic of what we're trying to do. Uh, as Venkat said, we're, we're sort of uh, going to start bottom up uh, by developing an understanding of what people's actual loads are and how those loads might change as you electrify. Uh, we're going to use a combination of their utility build data, building energy models to arrive at that. Uh, we'll do some power system modeling, which I'll describe in a minute. Uh, and the purpose of that power system modeling is to predict the rate at which you get resource adequacy driven failures in the future as the grid changes in the ways that I described. Uh, and we also want to do qualitative work where we try to understand how people cope with resilience now. Um, and similar to several of the projects here, to understand what loads people value, what, what services do they actually want, 
both in their homes, but also in the community. So if the power goes out, you know, I may want my fridge to continue to work. Maybe if I have some medical equipment, I want that to continue to work. If it's the winter, I want the furnace or heat pump to work. But maybe I also want my grocery store to work. Maybe I want the gas station to have power. So how do we elicit those preferences? Um, and finally, uh, the idea is to use that to design a system which, uh, which works adequately for these people. Um, and the idea is to do that iteratively, to try and understand what you can get at what price, and then to understand what trade-offs people are willing to accept between what this will cost and how much resilience they can get. Um, so th as you can see, there's a lot of moving parts in this. There's lots of methods and data, uh, and so I'll highlight a couple of them. Uh, this is work done by uh, former colleagues uh, at Carnegie Mellon where they used a card stacking exercise to try and understand what loads people valued and then uh, to put a limit on how much power was available in some kind of backup system to understand what they valued. Uh, we want to extend this work first by asking what loads they value within their house, but also in the community. This work showed that people will actually pay to provide some resilience to the community, but not exactly what uh, they want in that community uh, to be resilient. Uh, we also want to, uh, if possible, try and trace some kind of demand curve for resilience, where uh, you actually tell people how much resilience they can get at a particular price. And then as you vary the price, how does uh, the amount of resilience that they want change? Uh, in a cold climate uh, like ours, this, this was run uh, in the context of uh, a summer outage. I think it would be interesting to run this in the context of the winter as well. Uh, and finally, uh, we, pl uh, we want to use techno-economic modeling to try and understand what the supply curve for resilience is. What does it cost to design a system that provides different levels of resilience? So that's one set of methods. Uh, another set of methods uh, deals with predicting resource ad uh, adequacy. Um, this is uh, work that was recently published by Michael Craig, and we, we plan to build upon this work. And what this does is that uh, climate scenarios are fed into uh, a capacity expansion model and uh, a, a dispatch model, a resource adequacy model, uh, and, for, and uh, demand is calculated based on that climate, and then you identify the hours of the year uh, when demand is projected to exceed supply. Um, and this model allows you to predict how the output of both thermal and renewable energy changes as the climate changes and also stochastically. Um, so the idea, is to, uh, the idea is to use this approach to try and predict uh, um, the future of resource adequacy failures in, uh, in this region. Uh, but one of the things that we want to try and do is also to find a way of predicting uh, uh, or at least incorporating distribution system failures because distribution system failures are actually a larger driver of outages. Uh, one, of the, uh, one of the things that we're really excited about is the ability to go into communities and gather fine-grained data. Uh, for a lot of uh, the things that we're interested in, like energy burdens and equity, there is, uh, there is data publicly available. For example, I can go to the census tract uh, in Wayne County, and it would tell me that the average uh, energy burden in that county is 8%, which is very high. Uh, but by going to the households in that community, I learned that there are, uh, there's a non-trivial number of households that face 10, 20, 30% energy burdens annually. And by looking at their energy bills, I know that in the winter and summer, those burdens are even higher. And I understand what actually drives those burdens in terms of behavior and infrastructure. Um, it also allows me to do some technical modeling by a detailed analysis of their bills. I can tell uh, what it would cost that household to switch to a heat pump, how the load profile of that household would change if they shifted to heat pumps, and uh, that allows us to actually understand what resilient solutions would work for them and not just in the aggregate. In terms of stakeholder engagement, we're meeting with our colleagues at the city of Ann Arbor on a weekly basis. We've been doing this uh, for quite some time, for six months or so, so we have a good understanding of what they're trying to do and of their community partners, the Washtenaw Community Action Network, um, and also Elevate Energy. Um, 
we will start to do direct community engagement uh, in the spring and summer. Uh, in terms of how we're uh, supporting earnest goals, uh, I don't want to repeat all of this. Uh, I've, I've kind of highlighted as I went along how the project uh, supports the goal. Uh, but the last, the last point is important also. We will train a student uh, to not only design, for example, a microgrid, which is something that the student knows how to do. They've come from an environmental engineering background, but also to engage with the community and thoughtfully think about uh, how what they learn from the community influences how they use the technical tool and how they interpret the results from the technical tool. Um, anticipated findings, uh, methods to uh, sort of quantify the community level need for uh, resilience, um, developing supply and demand curves for resilience, uh, understanding how these supply and demand curves vary based on people's socioeconomic circumstances. Again, this is uh, a sort of metric for uh, equity and resilience. Uh, and ultimately, the goal really is to design tools that communities find useful and that we co-develop with them. Um, so obviously, we're uh, extremely grateful uh, to DOE that we get to do this work. Uh, our partners at the city of Ann Arbor. And a lot of this work builds on a foundation of prior work that was supported by the DOE Building Technology Office uh, and by the University of uh, Michigan's Graham Institute of Sustainability. Thank you very much. Great. Uh, thanks again, uh, Ilu and Parth, for the project uh, descriptions. And just listening to them, uh, I think that the approach uh, is applicable not just for communities within cities, but communities nationwide, uh, really. I mean, so, so I think those are fundamental approaches, and I look forward to kind of uh, seeing them evolve. Um, first, any questions from the audience uh, for this? I have a couple of my own. There you go. There's questions. Uh, hi, I'm Shane from, uh, from Pasadena. Um, it sounds like the kind of analysis, uh, uh, my question is directed to Parth, uh, the kind of analysis that you're doing, you kind of wish that your own utility was doing. I mean, you're, you're doing a lot of really advanced stuff in modeling and resiliency, kind of uh, resource adequacy, understanding, all that kind of stuff. Um, can you provide just a little bit more uh, political color on what's going on? I'm kind of aware that, that and you, you alluded to it, the city of Ann Arbor is looking to try and take more ownership of its local infrastructure. And I think, there, I think I read that the city of Ann Arbor was trying to buy its infrastructure back from DTE, which is, um, uh, I think, your local provider. Um, can you just provide a little bit more background on what's going on there and what your goals are? Yeah, so um, there's, there's two schools of thought, one of, which is, uh, one of which is that the city actually ought to buy out the utilities' assets. Uh, another school of thought is that the city ought to create its own assets that operate in parallel with the utilities' assets because um, the process of acquiring the utilities' assets uh, might be slow, litigious, uh, and, uh, and basically expensive for the city. Uh, also, the city kind of standing up its own utility does not preclude its eventually buying the utilities' assets if it, uh, if it comes to that. Um, the utility you know, doesn't want its assets bought, uh, wants to reassure the community that uh, it, is, uh, it is committed to both uh, decarbonization and to improving resilience. Um, and within the city of Ann Arbor, uh, this debate re uh, remains unresolved as to what we should do. There's, there's kind of proponents, there are city hall votes about both of them, but there's, there's a mandate to explore both those options and to, uh, and to sort of technically analyze them. Does that help? Yeah, good luck. Yeah, <laughs> Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you both for your presentations. Um, I'm curious for both of you, but also especially to Parth. Um, so these communities, which are traditionally low income and have already had a lot of disadvantages thrown at them, are now also serving as frontier communities where you're trying to build an electrification effort, which is quite commendable. I'm curious what keeps you both up at night in terms of how this research could progress and if there are kind of failures on uh, how resilient those communities can be in the face of power outages, how you might see that play out long term. Yeah, so um, 
I'll, I'll give you actually a recent uh, example about uh, that kind of describes what keeps me up at night. Uh, one of my students who studies electrification and actually produced some of the charts that you saw there uh, kind of bought into her own research and completely electrified her home. And we had, uh, we had a bit of a cold snap, a fairly vicious cold snap uh, a couple of weeks ago. There's no gas in this house and for three days she did not have power. So, uh, you know, that, that kind of a failure in, uh, in a low-income home where, uh, you know, there's not the ability to go, uh, to leave uh, and stay in a hotel, uh, that is what does worry me. What, what do people do? And another aspect of that is uh, what do people do when you also electrify transport and, uh, you know, that actually diminishes their ability to even get away when you have these kind of events. So uh, that, that does worry me. And to some extent, uh, both Ann Arbor and the purpose of this project is to put in place strategies to mitigate uh, those kinds of scenarios. Hello. Well, nothing keeps me from having a good night's sleep, so I don't <laughs> worry. Uh, <laughs> well, actually, in our case, it was quite excitement, so not a concern that you couldn't go to sleep. The, because when we first proposed this to EPP, he said, oh, yeah, yeah, we actually thought about it. We even have the land, which once already uh, targeted being the first few uh, that wanted to build the land, uh, you know, build the solar and, uh, um, in, in those uh, sites. So they provided sites to us just for this uh, project. And when we approach uh, uh, KUB, which is the Knoxville Utility Board, they said, yeah, yeah, yes, we also have the site. We also think about it and what to do. So there is quite excitement. Uh, we, we anticipate this trend will go forward if we start to approach, when we start to approach other locations. So our strategy basically is we want to pick a different uh, scenarios, you know, different. So we don't have to repeat uh, very similar scenarios. We like to select a variety of scenarios so we can cover a very different community uh, set up and in order to, you know, provide a more general approach that, that is applicable to other parts as well, yeah. So it's, it's actually quite excitement that, uh, that we're getting a very positive response. So it's very encouraging, yeah. Great, great. I have one question on the community engagement portion. Uh, I, Parth and, and to you, Lou, to the extent you all made community. You have been making community engagement for some time, I mean, through the city and otherwise. How did you set expectations for the community in terms of cost and also in terms of, like, did you say, hey, if we do this, you're not going to get outage? What were the metrics that you were talking about to the community to get their buy in? Um, so, in, in the case of the Bryant project, uh, the it's it's starting with things that are sort of no regret things like uh, home audits, home insulation, and uh, a lot of these things are uh, are paid for out of grants, so they're often at no expense to uh, the household in which they're being implemented. So the buy-in really comes from uh, starting with things that uh, where we're reasonably sure that there will be no regret. Okay. Yeah. In, in our case, uh, many of them are starting as a pilot project because they want to start some solar and they like to put it in a very meaningful location. And this turned out to be a quite meaningful location and they also, you know, quite aware of, you know, uh, the disadvantage, serving the disadvantaged community and things. So it's kind of a, a win-win situation but by the time if you go into additional, you know, several more, I, I, I think that's going to be a good question okay. to find out throughout the project. But the pilot, people jump on it. Jump on it, perfect. <laughs> Any other questions from anywhere? Um, oh. This is a question for Park, um, but I think you answered some of my questions already. So are you doing mainly um, single family homes? What is the composition of buildings that you have in um, your community? Yeah, so um, 
In, in the study that we've done so far, they're mostly single family homes. Bryant is mostly single family homes, but there are some multifamily homes. Okay, so there is some multifamily, okay. Yeah. Um, the other thing we are interested in is looking at resilience as a more holistic picture. So when you go from, if you're thinking about a neighborhood or a community, right? How do, how do you actually, going from three fuels to one, what does it mean for resilience, community resilience? Are there ways to mitigate or improve community resilience? But also looking at, I think you mentioned uh, insulation and other ways, because ultimately when you think about customer resilience, it's not just the grid, it's about the building itself. So it would be very interesting in seeing how you look at metrics for customer resilience as being different from the metrics for grid resilience. So um, something to follow up on later. So, thank you. Great. Thanks, Ram. And with that, I think we come to the end of this panel session. And of course, we are going to the break, which means if you have any more questions, they'll be right here, just outside. Uh, so please help me thank all the panelists for sharing.